Welcome back to Upside Down Data. Let's talk about ICP and how high it could realistically go in this market cycle. So if you're not familiar, Internet Computer is definitely an ambitious project that's trying to basically disrupt the entire internet by allowing people to build using decentralized infrastructure to make things more efficient and cost effective. So given that ambition, a lot of people are wondering how high can ICP realistically go in this market cycle? ICP is the native token to Internet Computer. How high could it go? And you'll see a lot of people throw out a lot of different numbers, but usually they're not really basing them on anything concrete. They're just saying, I think that it could go to 100. I think it could go to 200. I think it could go to 1,000 without having any data or any grounding to base those estimates on. So what I want to do in this video is talk about a data-driven approach that I've taken using machine learning and simulations to get a better sense of how high ICP could realistically go from a data-driven perspective. So let's go ahead and get into that. So if you've seen some of my other videos, you're probably familiar with this approach. But if you're not, what we do is we start by building a machine learning-based model to predict the price of ICP at any given point in time, or at least a realistic reasonable estimate of where ICP's price should be at a given point in time. And we do this based on three inputs. We do it on the price of Bitcoin, price of Ethereum, and time. And the reason for this is that if you know where Bitcoin and Ethereum are, you'll generally know where other assets should likely be. They tend to be the barometers of the crypto space. If Bitcoin is doing well, if Ethereum is doing well, all coins tend to do well. If not, all coins tend to do poorly. So it tends to work quite well to look at how is an asset relating to Bitcoin and Ethereum to predict its price. And that time factor I talked about is really just a catch-all term that anything that's not being driven by Bitcoin's price or Ethereum's price, you can catch with that kind of time variable. And see, it does a very good job of tracking ICP's price over its lifespan. And what's useful about having a model like this is it allows us to ask questions. We can say, if we had some theoretical Bitcoin price, some theoretical ETH price, and some theoretical time, where would we expect ICP's price to be in that scenario? So what we're gonna do in this video is we're really worried about bull market scenarios, right? This cycle, if we really are in a bull market, what we're concerned about is how high could ICP go if Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the rest of the crypto market experiences a full-on bull market. So the way we do that then is we basically run a bunch of simulations. We're not interested in just picking one Bitcoin price, one ETH price, and one date, because we don't know if those are the right ones to pick to think about if that's a realistic bull market scenario. We want to test a whole bunch of them and then see how ICP would be expected to behave in those different scenarios. So what we do is we basically run a bunch of simulations. We pick realistic ranges for our different inputs. So for our price of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the dates. And so what I've done here is basically the high that Bitcoin has put in around 73K up to about five times Bitcoin's prior all-time high from last cycle, which was 69K. And then for Ethereum, it's a similar idea. It's all-time high and then six times that. So a bit of a higher range for ETH, but it being a lower market cap asset seems reasonable. And then the dates. And so this is basically where would we maybe see the cycle ending. And so based on history, we might expect it somewhere in the general ballpark of later this year to somewhere in mid 2026, just based on history. Somewhere in there is a plausible range. And it's not to say that in any given scenario, any of these values would necessarily have to get hit, but that's the whole point. We're running simulations. And what we do is we randomly sample from these ranges. And then we ask the model, where would you expect ICP's price to be in the scenario? We then reset and do it again and do it again and do it again 10,000 times. So the idea is you're testing out a whole different bunch of possible scenarios. Ones where Bitcoin goes absolutely crazy and ETH goes absolutely crazy. Ones where maybe Bitcoin struggles a bit, but ETH outperforms. Ones where Bitcoin really is leading the show and maybe ETH doesn't follow as much, so on and so forth with a bunch of different possible ending times. And we're getting then a distribution of expectations of what could happen for ICP's price in that whole range of possible futures. So what we can do then is once we've run those simulations, we can look at the summary statistics. We can basically look at what is the average predicted price, the median predicted price. We can also look at different percentiles. So for this particular simulation that I ran, what we get is an average expected ICV price of uh, just under $44, median price close to that. And then the 10th percentile is around $17, 90th percentile around $73. And so this just basically means that 80% of the simulations fell between these values 10% fell above this, 10% were below this. And so we can look at the distribution directly right here and see how it is. And it's a relatively evenly distributed distribution with a bit of a skew going up to the top here in the more bullish sides. So 
looking at this, I think a lot of ICP bulls might already be in the comments saying, what are you talking about? There's no way that it's going to top out at $40 or, or, or under $45. That's crazy. It's going to go way higher than that. Possible, but based on this simulation, based on these data and how ICP is related to those inputs in the past, this is just what comes out. This is the expectation. Now, there are different ways that we can think about this. So obviously within the simulation, there's a range. It's not to say that the mean or the median or the end all be all, and that's the exact target where it has to hit. It's a distribution. We can look that above that, there are quite a bit of more bullish scenarios that exist going all the way up here to 105, quite a bit more bullish than that. Though, of course, there are also quite a few that are less bullish. So if you think that there's something about ICP that has changed over time, and maybe it will suddenly be a stronger performer in the market than it used to be, then maybe you're sitting more on this side of the distribution. Or a more extreme assumption you can make is saying, what if all of this price action we saw going up into the beginning of this new cycle, which was around the start of 2023, Maybe you make a very strong assumption that this actually doesn't matter anymore. That when you're training a model to predict the price of ICP, you should actually ignore this really nasty bearish price action from before, because maybe you think that there's some fundamental thing that has changed, that maybe ICP just got unlucky and launched at a bad time in the cycle, being around the top of the bull market when it launched. And so it just struggled because of the situation and no fault of its own. Or maybe you just think that there are new fundamental developments that have happened that just make this no longer relevant to what's happening next. Now, obviously, this is a strong assumption. I want to be clear about that, because oftentimes with assets, when you see this kind of price action, there was a reason for it. And so it's maybe a little bit questionable to just ignore that and say it doesn't matter anymore. But certainly you can. And there's always going to be examples you can point to to say when there's an asset that had had some price action that was really nasty that then went off to do impressive things. Think of ADA, for example. But there are also a ton of examples that you can look at that just went down, down, down further and further with price action that started this way. Now, it's oftentimes easier to think of the ones that did better because those are just ones that are in our conscious view. We talk about ADA because it's still a high market cap asset. We don't talk about the thousands of crypto products that have died that have had a really negative, nasty historical price action. But I'm going to leave it up to you to make your determination of what whether or not you think it makes sense to ignore this or to keep it. So the first distribution we talked about was keeping this in there, letting the model train on everything. What I want to talk about briefly, though, is what if we do the simulation where we instead tell the model, ignore everything that happened before 2023, just ignore it, pretend it doesn't matter, it's not relevant to what we're doing here, only learn from what we've been doing in this cycle, and then just based on that alone, where would you think ICP might be going? So again, if you're assuming that it's now in a fundamentally new place from before, that would be basically the assumption baked into this analysis. And suddenly things look a lot more favorable for ICP when you do that. You see the median being up here at around $175 or so, mean above 200, quite a far cry different from the prior analysis. And so if we just go then and we look at this on the price chart, we can see that for that initial analysis, the mean is about a 256% move to the upside from where we are right now. Nothing to laugh at, but not as impressive as a 1600% move to the upside like we would get if we use that analysis where we just assume everything before 2023 is irrelevant. So again, I leave it up to you to make your decision of which makes more sense, or maybe you think a kind of a combination of both makes sense, or somewhere in between these is the place to be looking. I leave that up to you. I'm just presenting the data. But there are different ways that you can do that. And that's the, inherently the case with any of these analyses. There are different assumptions you make. And so an assumption of leaving all the data in there is that all the data is still relevant and useful for the model to train on. You can make a different assumption and say, actually, I think this is not relevant anymore. Only these data are relevant. But I do think it's important to have a good reason for doing so. So I'm not going to tell you one way or the other, leave that up to you. But there are trade-offs and you'll have to kind of keep that in mind. But I do think that these types of analyses are useful because as I was mentioning at the beginning, without this kind of analysis, all we're really left with most of the time is people just drawing lines on a chart or just arbitrarily picking numbers, oftentimes picking numbers they want to be true, more just necessarily than ones that are realistically possible to be the case. And they just go with that. And that can be dangerous because if people anchor themselves to an incorrect prediction, remember last cycle with Bitcoin, everyone was saying it was going to 100,000, got a lot of people to buy at the top, they got absolutely destroyed in the bear market. The exact same thing could happen for ICP. If you have people who are just picking a number saying it's going to 2,000 without anything to base it on, but then people believe them, they might still hold, hold, hold well beyond any point that's actually reasonable for them to do so in a bull market. Never sell, get stuck holding the bag, ride it all the way back down in a bear market. So that's why I think these analyses are useful. And obviously these are not intended to be financial advice. You should make your own opinions 
with ICP and where you think they're going. But for me personally, I like to do these analyses because it gives an idea of a realistic expectation. And granted, the assumptions you make can change that a bit. I personally prefer to look at all of the data, generally speaking. I don't like to make super strong assumptions, but if you think that that strong assumption I made here, for example, was reasonable with the second analysis, more power to you. But at the very least, it gives us reasonable expectations that in kind of this all-encompassing scenario, maybe this is a reasonable target. And if we got up to this level, maybe it would be useful to reevaluate the thesis and think, do we still think that there's a strong case for ICP to go higher? Or maybe now is about as high as we expect it to go. But alternatively, if you think there really is some fundamental shift that has happened, then maybe you'd be happy to hold beyond that because you think this higher target is reasonable. So it's up to you to make that determination of which side you kind of would fall in for that. But that's one of the things that I like to look at is not just what are the models saying, but you can also look at different assumptions and what things might look like in those scenarios. All right, if you like the content, or subscribe to the channel, give the video a like and follow us over on X. A lot of updates from our models and more over there. You can go to our website, clarity to see live data from our different models and more.